、えー、大変長らくお待たせいたしましたただいまから2012年第28回日本国際賞受賞者による受賞記念講演会を開催させていただきます健康医療技術分野での2012年ジャパンプライズを受賞されましたシカゴ大学のジャネット・ラウリー博士とオレゴン健康科学大学教授のそしてナイトガン研究所長でありますブライアン・ドラッカー博士,博士でブループリントメディスン社創立者ので取締役でありますニコラス・ライドン博士に「白血病狙い撃ち」というテーマでパネルディスカッションをしていただきます。でコーーディネーターは熊本大学医学部血液内科教授の三谷博明先生がお務めくださいますそれでは三谷先生ご用意ができましたらよろしくお願いいたします Good evening and welcome to the symposium、uh, So first I will give some background、uh, because most of you may know or may, may not know or may know what、uh, chronic myelogenous、uh, leukemia is So,、uh, I will get you some background and also some history of、uh, their discoveries.、Uh, but I will do it in Japanese because most of you are from,、uh, not from Japan, but,、uh, you live in Japan, you speak Japanese. Okay,、uh, can I get my slide, please? まず最初に日本語で、えー、皆様にお話申し上げたいと思います。ここにありますように、かつての富士、そして死の病であった慢性骨髄性白血病は、今やコントロール可能な疾患となり、今や治癒への努力が続けられております。まず最初に皆様には、この慢性骨髄性白血病、クロニックマイルジーナスウケーミア、CML と略されますが、どのような病気かということについてお話申し上げたいと思います。この慢性骨髄性白血病、CML とは、血液のいわば元となる増血幹細胞遺伝子に異常が起こりまして、白血球が異常に増殖する血液のがんの一種でございます残念ながらその遺伝子異常が白血球に起こる理由は不明でございます日本でも、えー、欧米でも1年間に100万人あたり10から15人の方がこの慢性骨髄性白血病 CML にかかられます男性にやや多く発症年齢中心値は45歳から55歳で中年以降の方々に多く発生いたします慢性骨髄性白血病といいますから最初の慢性期は自覚,症自覚症状に乏しいのですが数年後に急性期に移行しますと急性白血病と同様の症状すなわち発熱や感染症や出血が出現して死に至るわけでございます。この白血病というのはドイツの有名な医学者病理学者であるウィルヒョウという先生が1845年にどのような病気かということでヴァイセスブルードリューケミーつまり白い血液ホワイトブラッドであってホワイトブラッドを持っているからリューケミアで白血病という名前が付けられたわけでございまして左側は正常健常の方々の血液を取りまして血液が固まらないようにいたしますとこのようにほとんど白血球は見えませんところがこの慢性骨髄性白血病にかかられた方の血液を取りまして血が固まらないようにいたしますとこのようにたくさんの白血病細胞がございますで正常な白血球はだいたい5000から8001立方ミリメートルあたりところがこの患者さんではなんと40万ですからこのように白いい白血病細胞がたくさんございますですからこれを混ぜますと血液は少し白っぽく見えるそれで白血病というわけでございまして特に著しい異常というのは、えー、左側の、えー、ちょうどあばら骨に隠れているのが脾臓でございましてこの脾臓は普通は触れませんところがこの慢性骨髄性白血病になりますとこのように皮腫この脾臓が大きくなってしまうわけでございましてこの中にもたくさんの白血病細胞が進んでいるわけでございますでこの白血病細胞がどこに主として存在するかといいますとそれは骨髄の中でありまして骨髄というのは私たちの大切な血液やリンパ球などを作る工場でございましてその工場は
骨髄つまり大きな骨の中にございますこれを骨髄と言いましてこれは治療前の CML の患者さんのものでございましてこのようにぎっしりと白血球これは異常な白血病細胞でございますこのようにぎっしりと入ってましてこれが弱拡大これが胸拡大ですからお写しにいたしますとこのように下の方ちょっと見えないかもしれませんが主従の成熟段階の下流球形というそのような白血球細胞の増殖が観察されますこれが CML 慢性骨髄性白血病の患者さんの血液を作る工場の中であるわけですところがうまく治療を行いますとこのように減ってしまいます減っているかのように見えますが実はこれが正常な骨髄像でございますこれを大写しにしてみますとこのようにまばらに大切な若い血液細胞が見られますでこの2つを並べてみますとその差がよくお分かりになると思いますこれは慢性骨髄性白血病の骨髄像の治療前と治療後でございます今日はもう一つの、えーえー、方面からのお話がございますそれは分子標的治療薬という言葉でございます分子標的治療薬というのがどのようなものかといいますと例えばこれまではがんの治療に使う抗がん剤はその抗がん剤はがん細胞を殺す作用にのみ重点が置かれてまいりましたしかしそれだけでは私たちの大切な正常の細胞にも作用いたしまして体がひどくきつかったり髪の毛が全部抜けてしまったりまた白血球が減少して白血球といいますのはばい菌細菌やカビやウイルスなどと戦うものですからその白血球が減少しますとそのために感染症で治療のために死亡するなどの強い副作用が問題とされていたわけでございますしかし近年の分子生物学の進歩でがん細胞の生存に必要でしかもがん細胞だけが持っているタンパクにだけ作用する分子標的薬剤が開発されるようになってきたわけでございますどういうことかと言いますとその細胞がん細胞の悪性化に関わるミクロの分子を標的にしてその標的だけに結合してその標的の働きを阻害してつまりがん細胞だけを攻撃するというのが分子標的治療薬でございます今日の3人の博士の努力で臨床で用いられるようになりましたイマチニブイマティニブはがんに対する分子標的治療薬の最初の成功例であるわけでございます慢性骨髄性白血病は常に最初であったわけでございまして先ほど申し上げましたように血液が海のように白い血液となることから白血病という術語が初めて用いられたのがこの慢性骨髄性白血病であるわけでございましてまたこの慢性骨髄性白血病 CML の原因として主要特異的な染色体異常これをフィラデルフィア染色体といいますがこれが初めてそのようながん細胞に染色体の異常として発見されたわけでございます。そしてこのの遺伝子の異常が実は BCR ABL といういわば融合遺伝子キメラ遺伝子といいますがその産物がこの CML の原因であることが初めて証明され,てされたわけでございまして本日の最初のスピーカーでございますドクター・ラウリーはこの9番と22番の染色体のテンザトランスロケーションといいますがこのテンザと呼ばれる染色体の組み換えによって異常遺伝子が発生するメカニズムを世界で初めて解明されたわけでございますさてその最初のがんの分子標的治療薬がイマティニブでございましたその開発の経緯について少し述べますと1986年にノバルティスの前身千葉外儀という製薬企業で BCRABL の遺伝子産物を標的として治療薬を作ろうということになりまして分子設計が開始されまして多数の誘導体が合成されまして結果的に口から飲んでいい蛍光投与可能なこのイマティニブが選ばれたわけでございます2人目のスピーカーのドクターライドンはこの 
BCR、ABL の機縄でを標的にした治療薬の開発に着手されまして、多数の化合物を合成され、町二部の開発へと導かれたわけでございます。1993年にドクター・ライドンとドクター・ドラッカーは共同研究を始められまして、今町二部に CML 細胞、つまり白血病細胞を強力に障害する、殺すことが分かったわけでございまして、そしてドクター・ドラッカーは1998年に臨床試験、最初の臨床試験を米国で開始されまして、このドクター・ドラッカーとドクター・ライドンの共同研究で、試験管内でまず最初に白血病細胞が強力に殺されるということを発見されまして、そして臨床試験で 90% 以上の患者さんで、この CML 細胞を検出不可能なレベルにまで減少させたわけでございます。それからわずか3年で2001年、イマティニブが米国で、そして2002年に日本でこの最初のがんの治療薬、分子標的治療薬として、CML 治療薬として認可されたわけでございます。これが、えー、慢性骨髄性白血病とは何か、そしてイマティニブ開発がどのように行われたかの私のイントロダクションでございます。Now, Uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Lowry to give your own talk and uh, please uh, Hakushi wo onegai itashaku donjimasu. So the title of my talk is The Philadelphia Chromosome Story. Many of you will have remembered the movie. In about 1940,、uh, that was called the Philadelphia Story. And I've just modified that because what I'm going to tell you really is a story. It's one of the most exciting stories in、uh, the late 20th century. And it really illustrates the importance in science of intelligence, of perseverance. Of collaboration and having good colleagues,、uh, and uh, all together、uh, they've led to the success that you're about to hear this evening.、And、what I plan to do is to talk not only about、uh, my own discovery of translocations, as you've been introduced to, but also how other scientists built.、Uh, Independently on other aspects of、uh, understanding viruses and genes, which had the whole、uh, effort come together. So, the first thing is a timeline, and here you can see the, the story begins with efforts of David Hungerford, who was a cytogeneticist and a graduate student. Peter Knoll, who was a junior faculty、uh, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. And through their collaboration,、uh, they showed that there was an abnormal chromosome in CML, as has been described、uh, already. And you'll notice the date 1960. In 1972, using new technology, I reported a chromosome translocation at 821. And then a few months later, as I was studying CML, I reported that the Philadelphia chromosome、uh, was really associated with the translocation. And this is reported in 1973. The genes at the translocation breakpoints were cloned in 1984. And then <clears throat> Brian Drucker and Charles Sawyer and other colleagues showed that a compound. Initially called STI 571 Gleevec and now Amantinib, targets the fusion protein and can successfully treat CML. What you notice from this slide is that this took almost 40 years, which is far too long for a quick, successful treatment. But I also caution you to note that the first translocation. Discovered at roughly the same time in 1972,、uh, still has no specific treatment. 
So we have a lot of work yet ahead of us. This shows you what the chromosomes look like when uh, Noel and Hungerford were working in the 60s. And you can see these chromosomes are stained uniformly along the length of the chromosome, and similar size and shaped chromosomes were put together in groups. But within a group, you couldn't tell one chromosome from another. And this is very important to the story. Here's the Philadelphia chromosome. So this is what David Hungerford actually saw, was that one small chromosome was too small. And it was assumed that a piece of DNA was missing from the cell, and that whatever genes were contained on that DNA were important for controlling cell growth. The loss of those genes led to the uncontrolled growth that you saw in uh, Dr. Matsui's uh, illustrations of the bone marrow. I was fortunate to have uh, uh, begun this study when a new technology was developed. And here you see now that the chromosomes have a series of dark and light bands, and they're different in each chromosome. So that you can see here the Philadelphia chromosome, and you can see this is the normal counterpart, the chromosome 22. And you see that it has a pale band, and then a very narrow, darker band, and then a pale band. Now, if you look at this group of chromosomes that all looked alike on the previous slide, you'll notice that here is a normal chromosome 9. And this chromosome 9 is too long. Not only is it too long, but it has a pale, a dark, and a pale band, just like the material that's missing from the Philadelphia chromosome. So I assumed that this was a translocation, and that turned out to be the case. So uh, this discovery of the translocation raised a lot of questions. Were the translocations the same in different patients who all had CML? Was it reciprocal? And that means was you could clearly see that a piece of 22 was on 9. Question we couldn't answer at the time was any of nine on 22? And what drove the translocations? Uh, how did they happen? And how did they lead to the disease? And these were questions that we would answer. So I'm going to tell you the different threads of this story that all come together. Here in the beginning was a, was a, a scientist named Herbal, Herbert Abelson. Uh, and in 1970, he infected mice with a particular uh, virus that had been found in uh, mice that had tumors. But it took a long time to cause, to call, uh, cause the tumors, which is what long latency means. Uh, and they were a particular form of lymph lymphocyte called a T cell. Then. Abelson wanted to see if he could make different kinds of leukemias or lymphomas, not T cell, uh, but a different lymphoid cell. So he treated the mice just after they were born with a compound that would inhibit the development of lymphoid cells. And when he did this, the mice then developed uh, a form of um, a uh, hematopoietic tumor, but of B-cell origin, and they occurred fairly rapidly, different from the Maloney virus. So the assumption was that this Abelson virus had picked up a new gene from the mice that allowed this uh, difference in function of the virus. So that's one piece of the story just to tuck away. Then, uh, David Baltimore and fellows working with him uh, wanted to have an experimental system using a virus, uh, but also one that worked more rapidly. Uh, and so uh, they found that the Abelson virus, the one I just described, could take fibroblasts or lymphocytes and transform them in vitro, that is, it could make the cells grow constantly. And if you took these infected cells and put them in the mice, they gave 
uh, leukemia in mice. Moreover, uh, they found that the mice, uh, the, the virus contained a gene, and you'll hear a lot about this gene later on. The gene was tyrosine kinase, but if they deleted it or mutated it so they caused it not to be able to function, then uh, it was no longer tumorogenic. So uh, this, these are all important facts for you just to tuck away. Now, why am I focusing on Abelson? It must have something to do with the story I want to tell. And in 1982, uh, a group of scientists working together uh, showed that the Abelson probe was on chromosome 9. So that's one of the chromosomes that was involved in the translocation. And then a somatic cell hybrids, which are a fusion of human cells and cells from a mouse or occasionally a Chinese hamster, they could show that in those cells which had lost a lot of human chromosomes, if they retained the Philadelphia chromosome, Abelson was on the Philadelphia chromosome. Now remember, it's on chromosome 9. So that means that as, the, as a result of the translocation, Abelson moved from 9 to chromosome 22, and it was not on chromosome 9 now. So that's why people began to focus on the Abelson gene as being a critical gene, uh, or potentially, I mean a candidate, not critical, but a candidate gene to be involved in the translocation. These comments on the side are those that were uh, sent to me by John Groffin, who uh, was one of those most involved in this, in this project of trying to clone and identify the genes at the translocation breakpoint. Uh, up here is a map of the partial map of the Abelson gene, and these little black boxes are parts of the DNA of the gene that were homologous to the Abelson gene in the virus. Uh, and then uh, what uh, Groffin had to do, and Nora Heisterkamp, uh, was to, to clone through a very laborious uh, pro uh, process uh, the uh, rest of the gene that was missing uh, in this beginning portion of the gene. And they did this by a combination of a variety of, of molecular uh, techniques. And each time that they got a new piece of DNA and could map it, uh, they would test it on DNAs from D of CML patients uh, to see if they could see an abnormality. And they did this for quite some time. Fortunately, and you'll see here the date, March 14th, 1983, they developed uh, DNA tested with probes and saw that there were two bands on a, a DNA from a, from a patient instead of the one normal band that they expected. So then they could clone this uh, region of, of DNA and uh, map it just as they had before. So this is, this is the piece of DNA that they cloned from that uh, abnormally sized DNA. You can see part of it matches to this restriction enzyme pattern, and these are enzymes that cut the DNA. But here's a piece that doesn't match. And fortunately, going back to the same somatic cell hybrids that I mentioned before, uh, they could show that this piece of DNA was from chromosome 22. So they had cloned the breakpoint. This is 9, this is 22. Well, then they used this piece of DNA to look at more uh, DNA from different CML patients, but they couldn't find any rearrangements, no matter uh, how far, well, not no matter, but they, they went another 15 or 20 uh, kilobases, 1,000 bases uh, further, and didn't see any rearrangements. 
So they had the, the, incense, the intelligence uh, and the good luck uh, to take this piece of DNA and say, well, let's test it on other uh, patients with CML. And this is a, a, a result of that examination. So patients 1 through 17 are patients who have the Philadelphia chromosome. These are two patients who lack the Philadelphia chromosome. You can see when you look at the lanes, there's only one uh, dark spot, and, and it's the same as all the others. But when you look uh, at, at blots uh, 1 through 17, you'll see that there are two dark bands, not just one. So what this told them was that there was a rearranged band in every single patient, that they had a germline size band of chromosome 22, and the second 22, namely the Philadelphia chromosome, uh, gave a, a band of a different size. And each one of these bands is a different size because uh, the piece of chromosome 9 that's joined to 22 is a different size because the breaks in some of them are different. So what we can do now is this is the normal Abelson gene located at the end of chromosome 9. This gene was called BCR for breakpoint cluster region because the breaks, as I showed you uh, previously, could all be identified by a small piece of of DNA, and what happens in the translocation is that Abelson is broken um, at the beginning, BCR is broken in the middle, the ends are swapped. So what I showed you in the, in the karyotype, here's chromosome 9, here's the translocated piece of 22, and what the cloning showed was here's BCR and here's Abel uh, at the end. And so uh, the question, of course, was which of uh, these was the important translocation, and through a variety of techniques, one could show that this Philadelphia chromosome actually had the important fusion gene, beginning part contributed by the gene BCRN22, and the ending part contributed by Abelson that had moved from chromosome 9. Now there are, as I've already indicated from the number of names on, that I've referred to, uh, there were a lot of people involved. And this photograph was taken on the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome, a meeting that was held in Philadelphia in 2010. I won't go through who everybody is, but this is Alice Hungerford uh, holding a picture of her husband, her late husband, David Hungerford, who actually uh, identified the chromosome, and the DNA from the CML patients was given to her by Peter Knoll. Uh, the cloning of the breakpoint was done by Nora Heisterkamp and her husband, John Graffin, uh, and Owen Witte is the person who helped to map the Abelson gene and to show that it was a tyrosine kinase. And here is Dr. Leiden, from whom you'll hear later, uh, and a colleague of Dr. Drucker's, uh, Charles Sawyer, because uh, Brian wasn't able to come to the meeting. So Charles came and told us about uh, the uh, clinical use of, of Gleevec. So thank you very much for your attention. Good evening. So my part of this story um, started after the work uh, that Janet has described. And um, this was a slide that uh, came from a Scientific American review in 1984 when I was beginning this work on imatinib. Prior to that, I'd been working at the University of Dundee doing my graduate studies on an enzyme known as the psychic AMP-dependent protein kinase, which was the, the archetypal protein kinase. And the lab of Philip Cohen, uh, which was next door to mine, um, was very doing some pioneering work on signal transduction, reversible 
phosphorylation and its control of enzymes in the glycogen um, regulation pathway. So when I saw this article, I was really impressed by, here was the uh, kinase I was working on, and there was significant homology in this, what's known as the kinase domain, the enzyme domain um, that uh, was responsible for this function of the enzyme. It was able to phosphorylate its target proteins and change their function. And as Janet explained to you, the retroviral field where these um, uh, retroviral um, oncogenes have been discovered had identified a number of um, proteins or oncogenes uh, which included this tyrosine or protein kinase domain. And looking at this and based on my uh, background on uh, working on the, uh, the psychic AMP dependent protein kinase, I was very impressed by this and thinking these, make, these would probably make very good targets uh, to work on in the oncology field. Since in the retroviral setting, they uh, were very oncogenic. And in addition to that, um, in the early, uh, late 70s, uh, early 80s, um, a number of groups had begin, begun to identi uh, identify some of these as playing a por uh, uh, an important role in human cancers. And the first one was the EGF receptor, uh, which, where the Waterfield group, or Axel Ulrich had shown uh, that this was a homologue of uh, uh, the, at least the VRB oncogene, retroviral oncogene was a homologue of the EGF receptor. And the finding that the cis oncogene uh, encoded a, a, the PDGF receptor factor uh, that stimulated the, the uh, PDGF receptor. But the outstanding piece of validation that this was important came from the Abelson gene. Um, here shown as the uh, retroviral version, it's a GAG fused to the Abelson gene. And this is very uh, similar to what Janet has explained to you in the Philadelphia chromosome. So this uh, illustrates what Janet has just shown you, this reciprocal translocation between chromosome 9 and 22 results in the formation of this hybrid gene, the BCR Abelson oncogene. And you've seen uh, the similar slides uh, showing how Janet discovered this and how the molecular um, architecture of this gene was unraveled. So what does this do? Um, the, mole the molecular consequence of this translocation is the formation of a protein that has constitutively active protein kinase activity. And when uh, it occurs in a myeloid cell, as you saw in the introduction, it causes massive expansion of the white cell compartment. And this briefly summarizes uh, what this looks like clinically, starting off in a chronic phase, uh, which is initiated by this uh, tr chromosomal translocation as a chronic phase of the disease. Eventually, uh, it goes through an accelerated phase into a blast crisis, uh, which at that time was invariably fatal. So this summarizes why, at the time, we thought the Abelson oncogene was really the best target to look at to validate the importance of uh, protein kinases, specifically tyrosine kinases, as potentially good targets at, to uh, synthesize inhibitors for in the oncology field. Um, the, it was the only example where really the molecular pathogenesis of the disease was understood. So summarizing what Janet introduced to you, BCR Abelson um, is the causative molecular abnormality in CML. The translocation is detected in all patients. It's the sole oncogenic event early in the disease. And it results in constitutively active tyrosine kinase activity. That is, the, active, the enzyme activity of this hybrid protein is switched on all the time. And when you knock out the kinase activity by introducing a mutation into the, uh, into the kinase domain, uh, it is no longer competent for trans uh, uh, transformation. So this kinase activity is essential for its uh, cancer-causing uh, properties. So when uh, I started work on this project, uh, although we had the, ba the basic validation that this uh, BCR Abelson uh, oncogene carried on the Philadelphia chromosome was critical 
uh, for the disease, we really didn't have very good methods for studying it. So uh, the first thing we had to do is look into methods by which we could isolate enzyme inhibitors against this oncogene. And this is where I met Brian Drucker. He had created this monoclonal antibody, a reagent that can detect the result of phosphorylation on tyrosine. Uh, and this was an essential reagent for us to be able to do cellular studies and detect uh, the ability of an inhibitor to block kinase activity. And you'll see some examples of that later. Um, we had to be able to express these tyrosine kinases in an enzymatically active form, and uh, I was able to collaborate with the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute on methods of being able to do this, which uh, were very innovative at the time. We had to set up high-throughput screening methods where we could do this reproducibly and test m uh, large numbers of chemicals to find the initial inhibitors, which we then uh, chemically modified to end up with a selective drug. And of course, uh, cell assays, and this is another area where I collaborated with Brian extensively. Now at that time, there weren't many kinase inhibitors, and many of those that existed, the early precursor molecules uh, that validated uh, the inhibiting kinases would be possible came out of work um, here in Japan. Uh, for example, Hidaka uh, synthesized some early inhibitors of protein kinases, the isoquinoline sulfonamides. Uh, in addition, this is a very important class, the herb statin uh, molecules, which really validated uh, for the first time that you could um, make a small molecular weight inhibitor. In this case, uh, this was tested on the EGF receptor inhibitor. And again, uh, another uh, metabolite uh, that was isolated, styrosporin, a natural product, which really is the, the prototypic uh, broad spectrum uh, kinase inhibitor. So this slide summarizes uh, a lot of work on uh, how we arrived finally at Gleevec, shown this side. Shown here was a molecule that we isolated from a random screen. And this particular screen uh, was not um, directed at the Abelson um, gene product, but an enzyme known as protein kinase C. Um, so the, our interest in this was it was the target of uh, Forbol ester, and so we thought in addition to the oncogenes I've mentioned before uh, that the protein kinase C would be very important in oncogenesis. So in addition to the, the tyrosine kinases I've uh, mentioned, we had to screen against protein kinase C. And this molecule was identified there. It was a relatively weak protein kinase C inhibitor. And as Jörg Zimmermann, uh, our chemist, uh, modified this molecule, we eventually uh, found a number of important structure activity relationship um, uh, properties and uh, arrived at an, a potent inhibitor that hit three kinases, the Abelson kinase, the PDGF receptor kinase, and another kinase known as CKIT. So what um, was important for this molecule was the presence of this uh, three pyridyl um, moiety attached to the core of the molecule, which is known as a phenyl amino um, There's shown here as a flag methyl, and I'll explain this a little bit later from the crystal structure data. This is critical for the orientation of the molecule. But when we were studying the structure activity relationship of this chemical class, by introducing this, the molecule um, the prior molecules which did not have this, which were good protein kinase C inhibitors, on introduction of this, they lost all activity on serine threonine kinases and became very selective inhibitors of the Abelson kinase. Now, this side of the molecule uh, is very important for its potency, and um, the N-methylpiprazine at the end is important for improving its drug-like properties, uh, oral bioavailability, uh, ADME properties, and, of course, this is a salt, uh, the mesylate salt, uh, which was important for its uh, drug-like properties and formulation. So this summarizes what we knew at the time. Uh, this is probably uh, 1992 or 93. Um, it was a very potent in, uh, in vitro inhibitor of the, Abelson, the V. Abelson kinase. And in cell culture, it was able also to uh, potently inhibit the um, activity of the kinase as detected by uh, Brian's antiphosphatyrosine antibody. 
and it showed a large, uh, very good degree of selectivity as shown here, uh, very low activity against a, a panel of other kinases, which at the time we th were very proud of because we thought this was an extremely uh, good measure of selectivity uh, within the kinome. And this shows uh, what's known as a Western blot. Uh, we're able to inhibit the activity of the Abelson PDGF receptor and KIT receptor. And this is shown here. These are known as Western blots using the antibody that Brian generated, uh, showing that we can nicely inhibit uh, with uh, imatinib the activity of the Abelson PDGF and KIT receptors. In an subsequent work, um, an, using a, a cell-based system that Brian had developed, we were able to, and this was known as the 30D, uh, 32D cells. These are myeloid cells uh, that are dependent on a growth factor known as IL-3. So in the presence of IL-3, these cells grow. If you introduce the BCR Abelson oncogene into these cells, they become factor independent and are able to grow in the absence of IL-3. So taking these cells and adding uh, one micromolar Gleevec, we're able to completely uh, block the proliferation of these cells. And uh, it's shown here uh, in, at that concentration where uh, we see a complete block of the BCR Abelson phosphorylation in the cell, whereas JAK2, which is responsible for IL-3 uh, signaling, uh, is not affected. Now, in subsequent collaborations with um, a group at MD Anderson and a group in Milan, we were able to profile um, imatinib against a number of cell lines which were from CML patients or Philadelphia pro, uh, positive ALL patients. And as you can see, uh, these cells are very sensitive to the anti-proliferative effects of imatinib in cell culture. In contrast, uh, Philadelphia uh, chromosome negative leukemias and lymphomas were insensitive to the anti-proliferative effects of the compound. Now, during that time, um, there were a lot of uh, progress in, in genomics uh, and, and sequencing. And as you can see, uh, from when we started, uh, at the end of 1980, there were four known uh, tyrosine kinases, which uh, had been on that early, uh, early slide and had been identified as retroviral oncogenes. By 1990, uh, there were over 40 tyrosine kinases and as we know today, the total uh, complement of tyrosine kinases is 90. In addition, the total number of protein kinases is over 500. So the complexity in uh, addressing the question, which was very um, um, high in our agenda, was how do we get selectivity against such a large number of related enzymes? Now, today we know um, if you, if you remember back to the slide before, that panel of enzymes we were very proud of, uh, now uh, we can actually screen the whole kinome, meaning all of these 500 enzymes very rapidly. So this shows the uh, selectivity as we know it today of uh, Gleevec for all members of this um, related enzyme family. And the selectivity held up very um, nicely um, the there were only an, a few other enzymes that are hit by this that we didn't know about at the time. So this was a lot of luck uh, in the sense that we didn't know that information and we had to use surrogates such as those cell panels uh, to suggest to us that uh, this was actually a well-tolerated drug in cells that didn't express the BCR Abelson. And in uh, 2000, we finally understood the molecular uh, basis for this high level of selectivity, which we couldn't have explained at the time. And what we didn't know was that imatinib, shown here binding in the active site of Abelson, targeted an inactive form of the enzyme, um, which we didn't know at the time. And this uh, inactive form is a unique structure which is uh, bound by Gleevec and results in this very high selectivity. And uh, the molecular uh, interactions here are shown on this side. And very important is the fact that uh, this part of the molecule here is sandwiched between what's known as helix C and the activation loop, the beginning of the activation loop known as the GFG, 
motif, and it makes this critical hydrobond donor acceptor system between the acid amine of the molecule. Uh, this confirmation of the enzyme is not present in uh, many other uh, forms of the protein kinase family, so it's this allosteric site um, caused by the inactive confirmation that results in this high degree of selectivity. And this is shown in a model here. Here's Gleevec binding to the inactive confirmation. This is a model of the active confirmation. As you can see, in this form, um, Gleevec is unable to bind because it has a clash with this activation loop, which in the active form opens up the active side of the enzyme. So the reason for its selectivity is it's able to freeze this inactive form of the enzyme and block uh, ac uh, access to the active side of ATP. Now, this is, this is really, for me, a very critical experiment that was done in, in Brian's lab. And uh, it used uh, patient samples um, from, um, these are volunteers versus CML. And as you can see, in the presence of one micromolar uh, imatinib, uh, there was no effect on uh, normal colony forming activity in the rith uh, rithroid or GM lineages. So 100% colony formation in the presence of the drug, uh, very little change. Whereas in CML samples from patients, you get a, a, a very large uh, reduction in colony formation. And when these were analyzed for the presence of the Philadelphia chromosome uh, by looking for uh, BCR Abelson by a technique known as PCR, it was shown that uh, most of the cells did not have it, and it allowed outgrowth of normal um, um, bone marrow cells in this assay. And this really convinced us that uh, the um, CML was uh, really the right indication to test the next uh, part of this uh, project, which was the clinical uh, validation of the concept. And as introduction to Brian's talk, uh, this was the results from the phase one study. And at, at, when we arrived at concentration to the drug, which from those uh, ex vivo studies, we thought uh, would be sufficient in the, in, in the, in the plasma to um, uh, kill the, the leukemic cells and allow the normal cells uh, to outgrow, we saw a dramatic reduction in white blood cell count. So I think that's an, a very important um, a validation of the concept that uh, selective tyrosine pr uh, protein kinase is against a validated clinical target as that had been demonstrated by Janet uh, that putting the two together made a very effective drug. So at that point, I'd like to just um, acknowledge a few um, of my collaborators at Siba uh, Geige, which is now Novartis, Jörg Zimmermann, Elizabeth Buchdunger, um, Alex Matter, uh, and of course, some of my collaborators, uh, Brian Drucker and, and Charles Sawyer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Japan Prize Foundation and the Members Selection Committee for this prestigious honor. What I want to do in my talk is really discuss the clinical trial results with the matinib, but also how this informs us of a new paradigm for how we might treat cancer. As you've heard from the previous speakers, Dr. Rowley, Dr. Lydon, we begin with a target, b able as a therapeutic target in CML. And what I've done here is I've just shown you schematically what a tyrosine kinase does. So if you start on the left side, tyrosine kinases bind ATP, and then they transfer ATP a phosphate to specific tyrosine residues on substrate proteins. And it's these substrate proteins that cause all the features of CML that you've heard about. So as you heard from Dr. Leiden, if you could imagine blocking binding of ATP specifically to this kinase, you'd have an ideal therapeutic agent for this leukemia. Now, if you go back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, when Nick started his work at Sibagaygi, the general prevailing view in the field was that kinases were not a viable target. The first issue as you've heard, was there may never be specificity. If you think about 500 different kinases, all binding ATP, the view was that ATP is ATP, and if you shut down one kinase, 
you'll shut all of them down. The next concern was that they would never work, even if you could get over the specificity issue. The first was that ATP concentrations inside of a cell are quite high, and that you might never be able to reach therapeutic concentrations with an inhibitor. The other prevailing view was that single agents for cancer therapies will never work. Cancer is too complicated, and therefore a single drug could never be effective. Another hurdle to overcome was the concern about toxicity. If you looked at some early experiments done in animals that were born without, a spe out, without one specific kinase, they often weren't, weren't born alive or, or, or were not viable. So the view was even if you had specificity, even if these would, would work, that they'd be very toxic. But even if you took all those three things into account, one of the biggest hurdles for CML was this was a very small market disease. 5,000 patients in the United States, 5,000 more in Western Europe. The view was that these kinase inhibitors would never have a large enough market to make enough money to justify their development. Fortunately, we were able to overcome all of these arguments. And as you heard, we went to clinical trials. And I'm just going to show you the results of the large scale randomized trials um, with five years of follow-up. And what you can see on this slide is with five years of follow-up, the overall CML-specific survival is 95%. If you compare that to historical treatments with either interferon or other types of chemotherapy, you can see how significantly imatinib or Gleevec improves survival, taking a disease with a three to five year life expectancy to one with a 95% five year survival. But imatinib is not perfect. If you now look at six years, approximately 7% of patients have progressed to the accelerated phase of the disease or blast crisis, and 17% of patients have had some evidence of disease resistance or relapse. We've learned quite a lot about resistance and relapse, and what we've learned is the most common mechanism of resistance are mutations in the target. So the Abelson tyrosine kinase is the target of imatinib. The major mechanism of resistance are mutations in the target, or Abel. And here what I've shown you is the Abel kinase domain, and these are all the mutations that have been identified scattered throughout the kinase domain and their relative frequency. So to summarize CML, with imatinib, we've converted CML to a chronic condition. We know that relapses are mainly due to able kinase domain mutations, and in fact, many novel inhibitors have been identified, and many of them are currently marketed, and they have significant activity against the most common imatinib-resistant mutations. So where else has imatinib worked? As you heard from Dr. Leiden, imatinib inhibits able, and I've showed you activity in CML driven by able, but it also inhibits PDGF receptor in KIT and has activity in tumors driven by these kinases. So with KIT, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and a small percent of melanomas that are driven by KIT mutations. And then PDGF receptor is targeted in two diseases, one hypereosinophilic syndrome and another skin sarcoma called DFSP. So matinib has worked in each of the in diseases driven by each of the targets. I'll spend a minute or two on imatinib and gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Gastrointestinal stromal tumor used to be called intestinal leiomyosarcoma, but as compared to leiomyosarcomas of the uterus, these intestinal sarcomas are KIT positive. It has a similar incidence to that of CML with about 5,000 patients per year in the United States. This disease is unresponsive to most chemotherapy drugs with a response rate less than 5%. Now in 1998, it was, as we were beginning the clinical trials with imatinib, a group in Japan headed by Dr. Hirota and Dr. Kitamura Kit 
show that activating KIT mutations were present in the majority of patients with gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Based on this finding, we were able to convince Novartis also to expand their clinical trials to gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And we saw that in this disease, that close to 54% of patients responded extremely well to imatinib as a single agent. And many of these responses were quite rapid and quite durable. And again, we've converted a routinely fatal disease into one that is currently quite manageable. So what lessons have we learned from the clinical trials with imatinib? As you heard from Dr. Rowley, the first and most important lesson is it's the target. And selecting a good target was critically important. But also, as you heard from Dr. Leiden, not only having a good target, but having a good drug can lead to the results that I saw in our clinical trials, which are good results. So we think about translating the success of imatinib to other cancers, we have to start by identifying the appropriate targets. And in my view, these are the early molecular pathogenic events. But we also need to be able to treat early in the course of the disease to get the best and most durable results. And to do that, we also need to develop reliable techniques for early detection of cancer. And thirdly, much like we did in our clinical trials of the matinib, we have to match the right patient with the right drug based on the molecular knowledge. So as we think about the 21st century, it's my view that we need a broad-based approach to cancer. We certainly need many, many more specific therapies like imatinib directed at critical targets. But we won't make all cancers treatable just by targeted therapies. We also need to think about efforts into prevention and early diagnosis. And in addition, we need to think about modulating the immune system to attack and destroy cancers. So this is my view of our task for the 21st century to convert cancer into a manageable, treatable, and curable illness. So in closing, I'd like to acknowledge all the investigators who's helped me at my own institution, the Knight Cancer Institute, all the investigators throughout the world, including many of my Japanese colleagues who put patients on our clinical trials, Novartis who funded the clinical trials, and the funding agencies of my work from the National Cancer Institute, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, and most recently, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. But in closing, I'd like to thank the patients who went on this journey with me, patients who are now alive and thriving despite a diagnosis of cancer or leukemia, now doing many of the things that they enjoy, things like gardening, dancing, spending time with their grandchildren, and many patients traveling to Oregon for our clinical trials. And some truly remarkable individuals, this was the very first patient treated with a matinib who traveled from Australia to Oregon. In the year 2000, she returned to Australia and was selected as one of the torchbearers for the Sydney Olympics. But when I think about each individual, they then begin to add up to groups. Many, many patients alive and surviving despite a diagnosis of cancer. And this is certainly my hope for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Doctor. So this slide shows how chromosome analysis is done, or banding technique is done. Indeed, I have done when I was pretty young, like uh, 26 or 27, I did banding technique as you did, doc, uh, Dr. Lowry. And uh, the way is uh, the dividing cells would be disrupted, and the chromosome are spread out on the slide glass. And then uh, they would be uh, digested digested to a certain extent, and they are, they are stained, and then researchers would ask if there is entire or partial uh, deletion in any of those chromosomes. And then in these days, we can do this cut and paste on the computer. But in, in your days, uh, Dr. Rowley, I guess you are uh, 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 using scissors, and rearranging all the chromosomes. Uh, how, uh, 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 for example, how many uh, 
chromosomes could be analyzed one day. How many cells could be many, analyzed uh, right. in, in a day? Uh, well, partly it depends on the quality of the chromosomes, because if they're good quality, nice and long, as the illustration you see on the screen, uh, they're fairly easy to analyze. Uh, and uh, I never really took a stopwatch to myself to, uh, uh, to figure out, but uh, you can certainly do one in 10 or 15 minutes if they're good quality. I see. If they're uh, many overlapping chromosomes, as the picture in the corner with the black background shows, then it gets to be much more difficult, or if they're very short, then the bands tend to merge into one another, and that makes it, makes it very difficult as well. Let me tell you in Japanese then. So uh, the, the 細胞が、えー、破裂させるとこのようになりますけれども、えー、完全に重ならなかった場合はこのように綺麗な、えー、二重二対プラスの性染色体の X と Y がこのように分けられて、例えば9番と22番を比較して、ドクター・ラブリーはこの9番が長く、22番が短いということを発見されたわけです。えー、時には、えーえー、母親として、えー、ドクター・ラブリーはキッチンの、えー、ダイニングテーブルの上に、このハサミで切った、えー、染色体を並べておられたという話ですが。So no Hanashimo Mukagatimus. Doctor Lowry. So uh, I hear uh, you were spreading out those uh, excised uh, chromosomes on, on the dining table in your kitchen. Well it was the dining room table in the dining room. But uh, you're you're absolutely correct. And uh, if my sons who are here in the audience will forgive me, uh, I began studying chromosomes in nineteen 19- Uh, 61 and 62 when we were in Oxford and uh, cutting out chromosomes from several cells. There are 46 chromosomes in a cell. You can imagine if kids came around with things flying, including all my cut out chromosomes, uh, it's like uh, we used to call picking, throwing cards on the floor and then it was 52 pickup because there are 52 cards in a deck. Well, this was the same uh, problem. Uh, you get them all mixed up. So uh, it's true that I found the Philadelphia chromosome with cut out chromosomes arranged just as you have here, uh, but from several cells. And I certainly didn't want anybody uh, coming and disturbing them. Thank you. Kono, kono. リアレンジしてその異常を異常か正常かを決定するのに運が良ければ10分から15分で重なったりするともっとかかったそうですから大変な苦労があったと思います。Thank you, Dr. Lowry. So let me let me go to the next slide of mine. So this slide shows the basic approach for molecular targeting. So、uh, this will be a simplistic way to、uh, tell you how basic approach Uh, should be done for molecular targeting. Number one, one should pick a target molecule. So in this case, uh, they uh, picked up uh, uh, BC, uh, uh, the, the, the abnormal uh, genetic product, uh, BCL, uh, ABL. Uh, and if uh, one has to uh, evaluate uh, something, if, if they have something uh, out of uh, pocket, and then they should Uh, evaluate the activity uh, using uh, assay or high throughput assay. Uh, in Dr. Lydon's、uh, slide, he put HTA. So,、uh, if one is lucky enough, one can find the lead compound too. And then, of course, then the first compound which we find、uh, cannot be、uh, given to the patient. So, we have to optimize them to make it、uh, available to the patient. And then, if we are lucky enough, we can forward one or two to preclinical and or clinical testing. So, this is the structure of imatinib, as、uh, three of them、uh, showed. But imatinib was not synthesized overnight. So, first, they started with this one. 
two phenyl amino pyridine, which is uh, uh, which is, which is uh, the, the basic structure of, for of uh, protein kinase C inhibitor. Uh, and then uh, uh, Dr. Leiden uh, didn't elaborate how uh, he, uh, he went through to reach imatinib final product. And at least you, Dr. Leiden, you said uh, uh, it took three years from the left, from a uh, two phenyl amino pyridine to imatinib. Yes, roughly uh, three years of, of chemistry work to optimize the molecule. But before that, we had to obviously screen large number of chemicals um, to just find this initial uh, hit. So um, that process, depending on what target you have, can be you can be lucky and get it in the first day you screen, or you can take years to find a good quality starting point uh, that the chemist can work on. So in this case, I think uh, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, we arrived at a very um, a good qual quality compound that we could rapidly do chemistry on, and it evolved into this very selective drug. Because I'm not a chemist, I don't know how difficult it could be, but how many compounds did you, how many new compounds did you uh, synthesize? Well, I wasn't the chemist, but um, the chemistry team was headed up by uh, Jörg Zimmerman, and they uh, probably, and the other chemists working on all the other projects, uh, synthesized thousands of different compounds to arrive at this. Um, nowadays, you can do this uh, to a certain extent much quicker by using high throughput uh, right. technologies and parallel screening against all the kinases in the, in the kinome. So the, the, the methodologies now are much quicker than they were uh, right. when we did this project, this initial project. But at the time, so then you were doing uh, by hand, one by one? Um, Almost. A little faster than that, <laughs> but uh, it, it was slow work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this is the, uh, the uh, history uh, of uh, AIDS drug development and also CML uh, drug development because uh, if I'm allowed to tell you about my, my own work, I was involved in AIDS drug development uh, uh, starting in 1984. And then we uh, established a safe system for uh, HIV inhibition. And in 1985, we uh, demonstrated activity of three new compound, ADT, DDI, DDC, for potential clinical use for treating uh, HIV infection and AIDS. So after that, uh, ADT, DDI, and DDC were brought to the clinic. It took two years for ADT and six years for DDI and seven years for DDC after demonstration of activity of ADT, DDC, and DDI. So in the case of CML, so uh, Dr. Dr uh, Drucker and Leiden demonstrated imatinib activity, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 1993. So uh, phase one clinical uh, trial was started uh, five years after the first demo demonstration. So Dr. Drucker, do you have any, any difficulty uh, to go forward uh, to, uh, to uh, initiate a phase one clinical trial? Were, it took uh, five it, years. It took five years. Um, there were a couple of things that happened during that time. We actually were slated to begin clinical trials in 1996, which is a little bit more along your timeline. Um, but the initial formulation, which is going to be given intravenously, um, turned out to have too much toxicity in some, in, in some animal models. So that got the clinical trials got pulled. At about the same time, Siva Geigy and Sandoz had merged to make Novartis, um, and there was some reshuffling of priorities, and that um, ultimately led to uh, some additional delays while, additional, while the oral formulation, the pill formulation, was coming along. But ultimately, we were able to convince Novartis um, to move forward in 1998 with, with the clinical trials. But, you can see we had a very short time frame from 1998 to 2001, yeah. three years, which was That's remarkably amazing. fast. So we actually picked up a little bit of time <laughs> in, in the clinical trials. So but in, uh, after uh, your demonstration of activity of imatinib against CML cells, you had to uh, do a big effort to persuade the company to go yes. forward. So it, yes, it took quite a bit of effort. But I, Nick, Nick certainly was helpful there, and some of the internal champions, um, Elizabeth Bucknunger, um, Alex Matter, were quite helpful. 
and yep. certainly having my own patients who needed something were quite helpful to me to encourage me to continue um, to get this into clinical trials. I see. Well, I'm sure they, uh, they made a lot of effort and then uh, just I cannot uh, uh, assume how big uh, their effort was. So uh, I'd like to conclude uh, this session uh, by thanking uh, three doctors for uh, their uh, clear cut and uh, very exciting data set. Thank you so much. Thank you.